Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. This is an episode with Ali Krefsky, who is a seasonal uh, athletic trainer with the Green Bay Packers. She will be entering year two coming up here shortly with the Packers. And in this episode, we talk about just her experience uh, with the Packers and being in the NFL and what that all looks like as uh, she has one season under her belt. Uh, if you're a Packer fan, a tough season uh, with a lot of changes this offseason, but uh, Allie just gets into what she's learned, what she's taken away, how everything has gone as more things have changed within the NFL and the push for more female athletic trainers continues to grow and the Packers hiring their first full-time female athletic trainer as well. Uh, Allie does a great job just laying it all out and has served as a great role model and answering questions and she talks about that to anyone that is interested in working in the NFL period but also especially if you're a female. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. Please check them out for all your sports medicine needs. Again, we just saw them the other week at the Wisconsin Athletic Trainers Association. The Revive pneumatic compression equipment is awesome. Uh, highly worth checking it out. Also very affordable, uh, especially if you have a budget constraint to stay within and at this point, who doesn't? So please check them out, but without further ado, Please enjoy this episode. episode of Athletic Training Chat. We are on with Ali Krefsky, who is a, a athletic trainer with the Green Bay Packers. And I know Ali from her time as a master's student at UW Lacrosse. Um, I think we overlapped the first year there, at least for a good majority of it. Um, and then before I switched out, but still came across each other quite a bit um, in her second year. Um, and we're just going to talk about her experience in the NFL. And I'm going to kind of butcher this, I'll let you fill in exactly what you do, but seasonal or kind of annual employee from what I've gathered from other people I know that have done that, but um, I'm just going to turn it over to you if you want to fill in a little bit about your background and if you could kind of truly define what your position is, because I think they exist across most of the NFL, um, but if you could just kind of fill in with that and then we'll jump into the questions. Perfect, yes. Um, well, first off, thank you for having me on your podcast. I listen to this podcast all the time and I do get really inspired by everyone you have on here so it's just really cool that you not have. a paid endorsement everybody just <laughs> no not a paid endorsement <laughs> um, it's just really cool you'd ask me to be on this and share my story with your listeners so I am a fellow athletic trainer in the NFL some teams call them seasonals it is an annual type position so I am a fully certified athletic trainer with Wisconsin but here I am a fellow yeah. Awesome. Um, kind of the first one. So we talked about you really just finished up your master's just a year or two ago and kind of jumped right into this. What was your path to getting to the NFL kind of specifically with the Packers? For sure. So when I was in graduate school, I started looking around for the internships and immersions that I wanted to achieve as part of my graduation requirements. And one that really I really wanted, was really inspired to kind of go after for was the NFL summer internship. Yep. And that was the only one that really made me super excited. So I sat down with my program director at the time, Mark Gibson, and I told him I was interested in the summer internship and that's what I wanted to go for. And he educated me on the application process. So overall, I made my intentions and my goals very known to my program that this is what I wanted as part of my a graduation requirement. And so through the application process, Nate Weir at the Packers, he came across my resume, he ended up interviewing me, and uh, he decided to take a chance on me. So um, there that summer while I was in grad school, I reported to Green Bay in July, and I was a summer intern for six weeks during the summer training camp. It was a lot of work, a lot of long hours, but I had the time of my life there. So 
after that internship had ended, I went back to UWL to finish my last year of grad school. And from there, I had the new goal of wanting to be a fellow and or seasonal somewhere in the NFL after I had graduated. So I went back through the application process, applied to all 32 teams. And I must have made a good impression my time here because in April, Nate had called me and offered me back to become a fellow intern for the 2022-2023 season. And currently, right now, I'm going to continue on my fellowship. So I'll be here for another season. And so upcoming, this will be my third summer training camp and my second season with the Green Bay Packers. There you go. That is, as far as applying for the NFL positions, just if your listeners are curious, the summer positions and then the fellow seasonal positions, you can find an application portal on the PFATS website. I believe it opens September 1st and ends around the first week of December. But if you head to the PFATS website, it'll explain the entire process through there and you can apply to all 32 teams through that portal. Nice. Thank you for including that in that. I feel like that. You must have listened before because that was probably a question I was going to ask you later. Uh, <laughs> what is this first, so kind of your first full year, we'll say, since you did experience uh, summer training camp, so you had a good idea of what that was going to look like, but what was the first year experience like for you? You know, biggest surprises, you know, what were kind of how you thought it would, or, you know, just kind of the whole summary of it. Not a whole lot of surprises. Prizes. When I when I was here in the summer, I watched those fellows that mentored me really closely. I wanted to be just like them. And I I had a really good idea of what I was stepping up into, into this role. And I had a lot of good mentors along the way. In terms of responsibilities, there there are a lot. As uh, me and the other fellows, we are responsible for, you know, opening and closing the athletic training room every day, making sure everything is stocked. Uh, everything's clean. We help with treatments. We help with like morning treatments, pre and post practice. We set up the practice field. We tear down the practice field as well as game day sidelines. We're responsible for packing all of the medical equipment for away games and like making sure some of it gets on the plane, some of it gets on the bus. During games, we, you know, you see us on TV running out, giving water at two minute warnings at timeouts making sure guys are getting water when they come right off the field, checking for blood or any cuts that need to be covered up or if anything needs to be looked at, we call over a head athletic trainer or a team doctor. But overall, just making sure everything is where it needs to be at all times, making sure everything runs smoothly for athletic training staff and make things easier on them is pretty much our day-to-day. For sure. Um, Kind of a cut aside off of that, you know, so you you mentioned you passed the BOC, you're licensed in the state of Wisconsin, you know, you're fully a practicing athletic trainer, you know, working with morning treatments. Is there probably not a like dedicated educational process, I'm guessing, you know, like you were back in school or whatnot, but like, is there things that you're, you know, you're picking up along the way? Is any of that structured or more self-guided as you're kind of going through everything? I would say kind of both. And I think I, to one of your other questions, I guess if you don't mind me like kind of moving this one question into this, how is the transition oh, oh, oh. out of the grad program into this position? The transition from my master's into the NFL fellowship position, it was really great. At the Packers, I have a lot of controlled freedom. So I do work with athletes. I do use modalities. I write my own rehab plans for them. And I do have a lot of controlled freedom, that autonomy, but I do have a great athletic training staff that if things I don't know about, I can always ask them. They look over my rehab plans, give me advice to make them better. Also let me know what I am doing profession on. So I am, I'm growing. I learn every day, but I do have a lot of autonomy while I'm here. Um, And it's always good to know that I am clinically making the best decisions for my athletes at all times. Um, Sure. That's what every athlete deserves. Yeah, the transition was great. I do have a lot of freedom, but it's controlled. That makes uh, sense. No, absolutely. That make, makes complete sense. And that's where I was just kind of curious, you know, in that fellow role slash intern, you know, yes, you're on and you're working, but 
all the other things that can kind of come with that you know because some of those positions in other institutions get questioned on if they're truly like teaching you know moments type of a thing you know or is it just a way to have somebody work for less i.e some of the graduate assistant positions that happened uh or have been going on uh kind of looking back you know to the question on you know the transition from your msat program uh maybe not so much like modality wise um or anything like super super specific because there's only so much you can cover in two years in those programs but kind of on a broader picture is there other things that you were surprised by you know working at the setting that you are um in professional football that you would could have seen more exposure to or you know wish you would have gone back and maybe paid a little bit more attention to when you were going through the program um one thing would be i guess pay more attention to and learn deeper on would be i guess postural imbalances and like looking and identifying like movement imbalances sure um we did cover it in my grad program I mean, there was just so much, so maybe it was covered and it just, I didn't <laughs> pay that much attention. But during my off season here, I did complete the CES, and I'm yeah, no way like advocating that specific thing. But I thought that their the way they laid that information out, it made so much sense. And it like in grad school, it would be like a pronated foot, and then my preceptor would be like, "Well, what does that mean? What can you do about it?" And I'd be like. I I don't I don't know like <laughs> yeah yeah um short foot exercises but I think that material really made the not only what to look for but why to look for it and then what to do I don't know just looking back like that material I look back at so many athletes and so many situations I've encountered and it bridged a lot of the why sure and I'm, I'm kind of a person that needs to know the why if it's going to stick yeah um, so I think looking back just not necessarily the CES, but any sort of learning and balances and why they occur and then how to kind of attack them. I think I wish I'd I learned more in grad school, but now that I do know it, it's it's helped me so much more just in my short time of knowing that material. Yeah, I think you bring up such a huge point. And having gone through a similar thing, you know, if, when you're a student or fresh out, you know, if someone's knee hurts, what are you doing? You're focusing on the knee, uh, you know, where the pain is and then learning that just because the pain's there that's not necessarily where the whole problem is originating from and yeah, having taken that same certification a long time ago it was another one of those like light bulbs just flickering everywhere of you know oh we got to look at this and you know look at all the other you know the up and downstream things that contribute to it so totally agree with you and that takes time and experiences to start making those connections sure yeah uh, women in the nfl is becoming more common uh was big news earlier this year you know green bay hired their first uh full-time uh athletic trainer that is a woman uh how has your experience been uh, i just saw the other day you were covering some event um, and you had your woman belonging sports shirt on uh and so obviously that's getting endorsed um by the Packers and everybody else um, participating in that. But what's your experience been? How do you see it continuing to grow in the future? Absolutely. Yeah, that event was a girls flag open. So they had 250 female high school athletes who just played some flag football for the wow. afternoon. It was their first ever event. So it was so awesome. 250 is huge. That's great. And everyone brought their parents. So like everyone was super involved. <laughs> it was it was an awesome event. Um yeah, really cool to be a part of it. But my experience here working in the NFL and for the Green Bay Packers has been amazing. And I do get this question a lot by my friends and young AT students who reach out to me on LinkedIn who want to talk. And that question takes me by surprise every time because although, yes, I do work with a lot of men and I'm working for a football team that is all male athletes, um, I have never felt as if I'm outcasted or discriminated against here. I've never felt like I'm different than my coworkers. And for that, I am, I'm very appreciative because it, it doesn't feel like I'm a woman in the NFL. I just feel like I'm an athletic trainer, I'm here to work. And yeah, it's it's been really great. 
But as far as continuing to see that grow, I think we'll be seeing more and more women not only promoted and hired in the NFL, but in all professional sports settings. And I'd, I'd go as far as to say in every work setting everywhere, I think the idea of a male dominated profession will become less and less of a current label and probably more of a thing of the past and hopefully something we just read in textbooks one day. I agree with you there. Um, if you don't mind sharing, since you brought it up, you know, what is some of the advice, you know, to some of the students, you know, I'm guessing female students that have reached out to you on LinkedIn about getting involved, applying, doing all that stuff. What, what do you find some of your common responses being? A lot of my common responses, I say this to, I guess, not only women, but just anyone who reaches out to me in my past position as a student wanting advice is when you're in your graduate program, think about what it is that you want to achieve while you're there. You know, whether it be an NFL summer position or whether that be an, an internship at a high school or with the military, think about what settings and goals that you want to achieve in your program and make a goal and a plan for yourself on who you could reach out to, who you could link in and connect with and make your goals and your intentions known to your program and definitely rely on them for help, rely on them for their advice and their connections and have them help you, but don't solely rely on your program to just go out and make this internship happen for you because you went to school for your career and you're there to better yourself. And when you graduate from your program and you get your first job or internship, you're the one going and doing it. Your program's not doing it for you. So make your intentions and your goals known and make a plan and just go out and do it. I think that is great advice. So thank you for sharing that. For sure. Um, Honestly, didn't have a whole lot more specific questions. Anything that just around your time so far in the NFL that and working with pro football that we didn't cover that you would want to make sure that people hear or are aware of? I don't think so. Just if it's if it's something you want to do yourself, just know it's a lot of fun. It's you know being around athletes like this they're a lot of fun and it's a wild crazy setting you see it on tv and it's awesome but there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes so you got to be ready to work and you got to be <laughs> ready to put in long days and just know it's a grind but the reward i, I feel rewarded every time I, I leave this building and clock out of lambo every day so there you go wow. awesome That's... exciting but get ready to work <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, ready for the AT chat questions then? I am, yes. All right. Where do you see athletic training going in the next five to 10 years? And if you could kind of set, you know, a specific setting or example, um, whatever you would choose. I think just overall with the profession as a whole, I think the awareness of the profession and the need for athletic training will increase. And it's it's already increasing. I think there is or has been a lot of public displays of athletic training in recent events. And I think a lot of people have either learned about the profession through these public events and or learned about the need and how important they can play in an emergent situation. Um, even now on LinkedIn, I, I scroll in there every day and I'm seeing so many people advocating for athletic trainers in high schools and how important they can be in industrial settings and just the importance that ATs can play to the wellness of people out there. And so I think just that awareness and that need for athletic training is just going to increase exponentially, hopefully in the next five to 10 years. Absolutely. Agree with you there. Um, this one will be, um, what advice would you give yourself as a young athletic trainer? And by that, I mean, where are you going to set the time frame since really you've, only, you've been in this for just a handful, less than a handful of years? Yeah, um, I guess still being a young AT like myself, I guess, what I would tell other ATs like myself, well, first off, what I said before with the, just when you're in your program, make your plan, make your intentions known and, and get after it, like make those connections with people, you know, email them, call them, learn as much as you can and go out and do it. But I guess 
my second piece of advice is, especially this is more like newly grad coming out of the gate, really focus on just being a good, strong, solid athletic trainer at the basics. And by that, I mean, these programs went from a four-year to a two-year. And even though it is a master's, that's still a lot of clinical time, a lot of event coverage, essentially cut in half. And also, these programs are throwing a lot of information at you in those two years. And it's just a lot coming at you with a lot of clinical time that they're compacting into two years. And so I think it's going to take a lot more work for young ATs coming out of the gate to be fully confident and have that autonomy at full strength right away. So really focus on knowing your special tests, knowing how to deal with your emergent care situations and your basic and solid rehab concepts and the certifications and the fun equipment and the softwares. That's awesome. And that will come with time. And I think it's very easy to get out of the game and be like, I'm an AT now and I want to go do this, 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 and like use the software, and incorporate this here. And it is exciting and it's, it's fun. And I like, I like the certifications too, but yep. I think if you're just really strong at the basics, like prioritize that first over the fun, the fun stuff and the fun stuff comes with time. And I think it'll just make you stronger to have a foundation to build off of first. Yeah, that'd be my advice. I like that advice. Uh, what has been the most influential resource you have found so far in your career? Currently, the most influential resource I've found is the people I choose to surround myself with in this profession. I greatly look up to my bosses, Nate Weir and Flea, as well as Aaron, Andrew, and Kurt here at the Packers. Um, Alexis Schaefer at UW Lacrosse, she is another athletic trainer. She's given me a great deal of advice and knowledge and confidence, as well as I chose to go to UWL to be around Mark Gibson and learn from him for as much time as I could. And I think surrounding yourself with smart and supportive people will take you very far and will inspire you to work that much harder. And I look at it as knowledge is power and knowledge is a gift. So surround yourself with the people who are willing to share that with you and who want you to succeed. And I think not only for me, but for everyone kind of coming out of the gates of grad school, surrounding yourself with those people will be very influential starting out your career. I like it. As an AT in your role, not so much right now, because we said things were kind of quiet as we're recording this before everything gets going. But when things do get busy, how do you take care of yourself? Well, um, yeah, it's a uh, dedicate a lot of your time in the season I don't have time for much um and everyone on football side from equipment staff to our team docs to football ops like everyone just working around the clock for this team but I think to take care of myself I've just appreciated my close circle of friends and my family even more not that I didn't appreciate them before but it's kind of known that once season gets going if they want to see me, they kind of have to be the ones to make that effort and I will pay it back in the off season, but they really do. And my family comes up to as many games as they can. My best friend and her fiance will drive an hour to Green Bay just to get dinner with me to turn around and go back home. And I really, I look forward to those moments even more and I cherish them even more during the season. So I, I hold on to those people and keep them close. But as of now, that's kind of how I, I take care of myself in the, in the thick of it. If you could change or eliminate one thing, could be a modality, a common practice, a mindset, or anything of your choosing in the field of athletic training, what would it be? I think the mindset for athletes that the ATR is not a place to just come and take a load off or to come and be pampered or just sit on the table and get treatment and or a place to hide or, you know, you're there to work. and. You know, you work in the weight room, you work on the practice field, you get out there on game day, you're working. So the athletic training room, that's, it's no different. We're there to work on your injuries and we're working hard. So you're working hard too. I think that's my advice. And one thing I would change for the athlete's mindset. I like that one. I'm guessing there are a lot of people nodding their heads along <laughs> as you, <laughs> as you were saying that. 
um, <laughs> and knowing that it goes up to the professional level of sports. Last question uh, before we kind of close everything up, what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? The only word that comes to mind is selflessness. I think of all the ATs who have inspired me, you know, everyone I mentioned above and more, uh, their knowledge and achievements are very impressive to me, but their level of selflessness is even more impressive to me. I think being an athletic trainer means you are working with the intent for the betterment of the team and the people you are caring for. And whether your team is a football team or a military branch or an industrial setting, whatever that team means to you when you go to work, you're working to better them and the people who are in that team. And I, I personally always try and leave every athlete I work with better than I found them, whether that is a pain relief modality, I write a rehab plan or simply say, hey, how's your day going? Um, I think if you're not a selfless person, I think this profession might burn you out quickly just due to the sheer nature of why athletic training exists in the first place. Uh, well said i like that the use of the word selflessness there just i agree uh, and that's such a big part of our profession um uh, just in closing if people wanted to connect with you uh find you uh well obviously put linkedin on there because you've referenced that a couple of times but anywhere else uh that is best to get a hold of you or kind of follow along um anything that you're doing yeah please feel free to follow me on linkedin my email is really easy. It's just akrevsky at gmail.com. But if you LinkedIn me, I can give you that too. But I'm more than happy. Definitely it's easier to get a hold of me out of season than in football season. But I try and make sure to reach out to everyone who reaches out to me. I talk with a lot of students on the phone just about advice. And yeah, anything you need, any advice, just feel free to reach out. I'm always there. Awesome. Well, we appreciate that and appreciate it for everybody that's listening. But uh, it was great to catch up. Uh, enjoy the downtime before everything really gets going here soon um, and everything gets a little bit busy but wow uh, well maybe have to do a follow-up after year two and see where you land from there perfect yes i love that thank you for listening to this episode of athletic training chat with ali krefsky please connect with her if this is something that you're interested in doing she is a wealth of information and we'll give it to you straight and is more than willing to check it out. I can't wait to see what Allie uh, gets to do here in the future with all of the stuff that she's doing and learning where she ends up. Uh, thank you again just for listening. Every time you do any ad revenue, which we appreciate you listening to those ads, goes directly to our Throw a Lifeline campaign. Those are coming out. We are getting close to filling another one, so check out uh, clinicallypress.org if you want to nominate or apply for one. Uh, also, thank you for the Athletic Training Daily Journal. Uh, people that have checked that out, we truly appreciate it. It is a fun project that we're looking forward to continuing to grow. And as always, thank you to Mueller Sports Medicine for supporting the podcast.